morning. Who's going to cook today? Today, how to put more Benjamins in your pocket by handling questions. Just by being able to answer questions. You've got to figure out how to switch your mind from objections being bad to objections being okay. Because today we're going to figure out how can I handle objections? And the first thing I want you to know is an objection in your mind should simply be a question that once you answer it, the sale proceeds. You just have to answer questions. When you do this, you will feel like you are really in control of the presentation. You're going to feel better. You're going to feel like you're on top of the world because you can handle them. And last but not least, more mentions in your pocket. So let's start today with the whole issue of how you can negotiate. There's way, way too much attention spent on negotiation. Why? Because most salespeople sell products. Objections are just the bridge between making your presentation and getting the order. It's just the bridge you have to cross. So what follows from the process that we've learned? You spend 40% of your time building trust. You spend 30% of your time probing, asking questions, trying to determine whether they have the need that you know your products and services can fulfill. Then you deliver your presentation, which is simply describing the benefits, connecting those to the needs, and you have to answer their questions. So the thought I want in your mind is that I want to win, but first, I want to make sure I help my customer win first. And then the arrangement I want is when they win, I win. So when you negotiate, by definition, there's this idea that there are opposing forces that somehow disagree with each other. What I want you to know is that most times it's just about the price. It's right here. You've made the presentation. You've connected the benefit to the need. Now it's just about the price. Ultimately, you want to get a handshake. Now let's talk about the basic strategies that salespeople use and identify the one that you should use to get the best results. If you plot on a graph, the two notions of consideration and courage. So this is you. Do you have courage as a salesperson and do you have consideration for them? Now if you don't have much consideration, if you're just focused on you, and you don't have much courage, when might you not have courage? Well, it's Saturday morning. You have been out a little bit late at night, and you've had a few too many adult beverages, and you feel like crap, and your courage is at a low ebb, and you don't care about them. This is what we call lose-lose. It's a horrible negotiating strategy. Sometimes, if a salesperson doesn't feel good about herself, and she doesn't think she's going to get the order, she doesn't make the presentation. She lost, the customer lost. 
Now, what if consideration is high? You have a strong helping others motivation. You really want to help them, but you lack courage. Your negotiating strategy is called lose-win. When might salespeople deploy lose-win? Mr. Ryan? Whenever they're evaluating their chances of losing money. Lose-win means I'm going to let you win, but I'm going to lose. <laughs> so when might a salesperson do that? When they give really heavy discounts and you know, let the customer kind of control it. It's when you have to cut your commission. Do you like to cut your commission? No. Because here's what companies will do. They'll say to you, if you do full price, we're going to give you this commission. If you reduce your price, we'll reduce ours percent by percent. So if you make 50%, we make 50%. But under this price, we won't process your order. So you reduce your price in half. Do you want to go back? No. Do you want to go back to the customer the next time? Versus going to this customer where you get paid full boat? No. So you have to be able to defend your price. Is there value in your product or service? And the answer is yes. Then you've got to figure out how to negotiate and do win-win. Now what happens if you have a massive degree of courage, but you lack consideration. What's this called? Win-lose. This is the natural negotiating stance of almost every person who's been involved in athletics. Because in athletics, you win at their expense. And you point your finger at them and you laugh. Now, will this work in sales? No. But see, you've got this attitude from day one that I'm going to win and I don't care what happens to them. When you have high consideration and you have high courage, that means you know you've got the right product and you really want them to win, this is called win-win. This is a strategy that doesn't work here at the spinal cord. It works here. You have to negotiate from a win-win perspective, and it even gets better. The ultimate strategy is not just win-win. It's win-win or no deal. You have to be willing, if you can't see a win-win, either for you or for them, most on this, it's for you. If you can't figure how you're going to win and they're going to win, then you say, I sure appreciate the time that you've spent with me today over the last couple weeks. But right now, we're at loggerheads. I can't see a way that both of us can win now. And I'd like to put this off. Let's agree to come back a month from now. You do your homework, I'll do my homework, and let's revisit this. Would that be OK? Yes, sir. Here's what happens, guys. You walk. You get to the door. You put your hand on the door, and they go, wait, 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 come back here, come back here, come back here. Just negotiating price. Then you can win. Those are the basic strategies. Now, what's better in preparing for negotiations? Is it exhaustive preparation or is it a combative attitude? And the answer is the more work you do in advance, the more information you collect, the more you know about your buyer, the, ch the higher the chance that you're going to create a win-win. Now, what's important in the negotiation, we've said this over and over and over a hundred times, even though it feels like it's about you, this thought, it's not. <coughs> it's about them. So you've got to get to put your benefits hat on and focus on them. The more they feel that they're going to benefit, the more they're going to allow you to benefit. Now, there's a tendency 
in negotiating, especially with entry-level people, because you want the order right. You don't have very many orders, so the bullet in your gun is lower the price. If I lower the price, then I'll get the order. What's the problem with that? You lose money. You lose money. The next time you go in, can you raise the price? No. No, you're dead. You're always going to be at that level. So, I know it feels like lowering the price is the thing you ought to do, but don't do it. Defend your value. If the customer is focusing so much on price, you say to yourself, wait a minute, do I understand their needs and have they conveyed to me that they have a bona fide need? If they, don't, if they have not identified that, then they don't see the benefit yet. That means the value is not high enough. Go back. Build more value. <clears throat> Neil Rackham. Arguably the finest sales book that's been written in the last 30 years. Spin selling. This is what I taught you here. How to ask questions that cause the buyer to lean in. So Neil Rackham says this about negotiating. Negotiate late. What's that mean, Mr. King? Be able to get your customer involved first and then be able to talk about the product later on. What happens if you negotiate too early? You might lose the sale. It's all price, right? Negotiate late in the process. Two, negotiate little. So the more you get in a combative negotiation mode, trust goes down. You want to keep the trust level high, that you're in it for them. <clears throat> Last, and never let negotiation become a substitute for good selling. If they're leaning on price, you say to yourself, they don't get the value. What haven't I explained? What don't they understand? So, so what if you were an agent, like a sports agent, and that's pretty much the price is the big key. How would you negotiate if you were like the team to negotiate them down? So if I'm a sports agent, Mr. Philbin says, and price is the only thing. <clears throat> I'm negotiating a price for this quarterback to the Tennessee Titans, and it's all about price. If it's all about price, they don't value what the quarterback can really do for them. That's the problem. If they valued it, they'd pay. Go back. Obviously. So what you'd say is, if you're at a loggerhead, you'd say, you know, at this point in our negotiations, both of us don't see that we're getting value at this price. So let's talk about the quarterback. His statistics are blah, 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 blah. Your quarterback does blah, 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 blah. He's the one that does this. You need that. If he did that, you'd be better over here. I'm confused. <coughs> Isn't this the perfect guy for you? You've got, you got to go in. It's about value. It's not about price. Next. What if it's somebody that uses your product more than other customers, and that's why they want a discount? So what if they, your, your customer, if they use a lot of your product, they might deserve a discount. Okay. Discounting is okay as long as it's on volume. And, it's the, and you describe this in your pricing. It, of course it's appropriate to reduce your price with volume. Now, there are certain times in a negotiation that you have to walk. Why? Because your sales manager is going to say this. Below this price, if you submit an order, we're not filling it. We don't make money, you don't make money. At this price, above this price, and you have full discretion for charging the price that, that you want, above this price, we're going to give you 10%. But for every 1% less than that, we'll reduce our, our take equivalent to you. 
So we'll participate in discounts down to this price. You say to yourself, now I know what I need to do. So there are certain times when you're going to walk, when you're going to say, just like we said before, I'm committed to working with you to help you win, and, and as a result, we're going to win too at our company. But right now, we're stuck. I'd like to propose that we put this off for two weeks, a month. We schedule another appointment. You do your homework. I'll do mine. We'll come back together. Does that make sense? I'll go, well, OK. And you walk. So what if I had to make the deal that day? What if the deal only stood for that day? What if the deal only stands for that day? Is it true? Yes. So your boss said you got a discount, you can do it today. No. Yeah, if you what do this price? deal today, what you get price? this price? Yeah. Uh, basically, so the way we go in, if we if we clean for one day, we can sell a, a certain thing before we come back through more times. But it, if I leave that day, it's off the table completely. Okay. I can't come back tomorrow and resell it to you. So if we're here, we've done this work, and I propose to do this work, it's, the, it's at this price. Yeah. But we're not going to leave, take all our equipment out, and bring it back to give you this price. So what's the problem? Well, so <coughs> they, they say they want to think about it, but they can't really think about it over a night. Okay, so and we're going to get to this objection coming up. Okay. Hold that objection. Right. Ask me. Hold on a second. We're going to discuss that one, too. So sometimes you have to know when to walk. Now let's talk about categories of objections, because there are multiple categories. Oh, hold on a second. Before that. So what are objections? Objections are just the bridge between your presentation and your close. You're just answering questions. So what should you do? When someone voices an objection, you should welcome it. Why? Because they're interested. They wouldn't ask you a question if they weren't, even if it's a throwaway. And when you answer, when the objection surfaces, you smile. will discombobulate the buyer. I just told you that your price was way too high and you smiled. What is this? For instance, your price is in the stratosphere. We couldn't possibly afford that. You're right, Mr. Smith. Our price is really high. Yet, we sell these every day. Would you like to know why? Yeah. Now you're selling again. So again, let me go over these objections. Some of these you have to memorize. I memorized that years ago. Got that from Brian Tracy. That's who taught me how to sell. These are things you have to memorize. Because on the spot, you have to have, you have to be competing for the Academy Award. That means when you hear an objection, you've heard it a thousand times. Same objection. You do it this way, huh? Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I, no! You, add, you, add, you answer it as if it's the first time you've ever heard it. Now we're going to go over the steps in a couple minutes. But it's the Academy Award. Why? Because you're valuing the person. You want that person to feel that they're important that they're cognitive, that they've unveiled something you've never heard. It's all about the emotion you can plant. Now, what should you do? And I had a time on objections. The most valuable thing you can do is to ask yourself, what problems will my buyers have that will cause them not to buy? You might say, I'm too young. They don't know my company. You write down all of those problems 
Now, if you have a great company you're working for, they've already worked out the answers to 80% of the questions that are answered. And what you have to do then is you have to memorize them. And memorizing them means you put them on your voice, you say on, on a recording on your phone. You give the objection, you pause, and then you answer the objection. This is you. You listen to that over and over and over and over and over and over and over. So when it comes out, it's like an Academy Award. You are Clint Eastwood, and you've won. So first, identify the problems, figure out what the answers, what the best answers are. One helpful technique we can learn right now is the boomerang effect. Here's the boomerang. When they say, your price is awfully high, and you say back, our price is unbelievably high, and you only do it once. What are you doing? You're saying, give me more information. Our price is high. It's not going to fit. You don't think it's going to fit? It's the same thing as saying, really, it's just a boomerang. Say it right back to them. Now, you can't do it six times in a row because they're going to think, now, wait a minute. I asked the question, you asked it back. What? What's going on here? Next, forestall. So if you know, you know that your buyer is going to say, Mr. Bailey, you're going to put water on my carpet. And that water is not going to dry and it's going to be moldy. How many times have you heard that objection? If you know the objection they're going to have, if you know what objection you're going to get, you put the answer in your presentation. You forestall it. You predict. And you say it something like this. One of the things that my clients, one question my clients always ask me is, what's the risk of doing a water-based treatment and mildew getting into my rug? The answer is blah, 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 blah. Oh, so when you answer that, you take the problem off their back, and now they're leaning in because they wouldn't consider it because of that. So always take the number one problems you have that they're going to have, put it in your presentation. We call this forestalling. So how do you do it? So now we're going to talk about the Academy Award presentation that you're going to make. The customer says, My rug is too expensive. I don't want water on my rug. You listen completely. You maintain 100% eye contact and you listen. And now, so where's the rug from? You ask all the questions as if it's the first time you've ever heard the question. Then you rephrase. You can repeat, if for some reason you don't want to answer the question they've asked, you rephrase the question into a question that you want to ask that will also answer that one. Next, you reflect the emotion. So what I, what I hear from you is, that this was really, this is really an expensive rug, and it would just tear your heart out for something to go wrong. They go, yeah. And when they lean in, they realize that you're listening to them. You're closer to the sale. Then you answer it as if it's the first time you've answered. And last, you confirm it. So, Miss Smith. Have I answered your question about water on your expensive rug? Yes, I have. Why do you do that? Because if you haven't answered it, you've got to go back. Because again, this will put a shadow over your whole presentation. Because they'll think, I don't want you to hurt my rug until you answer it. Now, should you be using the golden rule that your mother taught you in handling objections? Treat others as you would like to be treated. 
that work, Mr. Upton? No. no. It might. You know, a, a, a broken clock is right twice a day, right? So it may be you're lucky that you're a high DI like you and you're given the same presentation and you deliver it the way you want to do it and it works. Now some salespeople do this and so they'll make some sales, but if they get a different personality, I don't like calling on people like that. Sorry. Right. It's like saying, I'm going to call on people whose last names start from A through L, but M through Z, they're the weirdos. I'm not going to call them. <laughs> Instead of the gold rule, we're going to apply the platinum rule. That is, communicate to others the way they want you to. Make your presentation the way they would like to receive it. Is this hard? Yeah, at the beginning. But if you begin today talking, communicating with people the way they want you to, you're practicing for every future presentation you make. Because it's not about you, it's about them. Now let's talk about the categories of objections. Category one. <clears throat> One of the biggest mistakes salespeople make. The no need objection. Now, Mr. Bailey, have you ever heard someone say, I don't need my carpet clean? All the time. <coughs> now, here's what this means. Mr. Bailey has not fully identified the need in his presentation at this step. If you ever hear, I don't need it, I want you to say to yourself, take out your gun, shoot yourself in the foot. Bang! I forgot. No need, no presentation. If you hear that, go, oh, no. Go back. Stop your presentation. Go back here. Begin to probe. What do you haven't got to your presentation yet? Like, you know, uh, you walk up to the person, I don't want it. It's the first thing they say. Right. You smile. You smile. You, you say, away. you know, Mr. Smith, <laughs> if I could have a nickel for every time I have started my presentation and someone said that, I could, I'll, I would give you half and we'd both be rich. <laughs> smile. Smile. Of course you don't need it. You have no idea what we're going to do for you. If I could just spend two minutes and explain to you how we could help you. Would you give me two minutes? Yeah, you got two minutes, go. Now you don't go, we're the best, we're the best, we're the best, we're the best, we're the best. You ask questions. And in the questioning, you're gonna figure out whether he has a need. That's how you do it. Next category, the hidden objection. Oh, this defeats lots of salespeople. Here's a hidden objection. Well, I, I can't buy today because I have to talk to my boss about it. I can't do it today because I've got to talk to my wife. Well, now listen, this is also a mistake you've made because you answer this question here between building trust and identifying needs. And you'll do this with your colleague in presentation. You ask this question. In addition to you, is there anyone else who should be here to listen to our conversation? If you decide at the end today you would like to put Culligan in your home, they'll say. You don't say, can you make the decision? Are you the decision maker? Because everyone's going to say, well, sure I am. You've got to hunt out the no poll. And the no poll will say, well, yes, I can make the decision, but I'd like to run it by this person. That means they can't make the decision. So what you'd say in real life is, would there be a way we could get your boss into the conversation right now? Or could we get your wife on the phone? Could we do this now? If the answer is no, the very best you can do is to make your presentation in a way that the person becomes the advocate for your product. But there's a problem with this. When the husband, the, when the wife talks to the husband at dinner and says, 
there was a delightful young man, a Mr. Bennett, who came in today, and he would like us, and he talked to me about our water. And you know, you know I don't like the taste of water, and I'm concerned about those bottles that were thrown away all the time going into the, into the landfill. And, and the husband's going, is this going to cost us money? No, I don't want it. See, when you put it on her back, she can't do it as well as you. So it is much better to help her understand the benefits to her and then to close for a meeting with the husband. Second one is to assume something away. So the person could say, I need to talk to my boss. My boss would have to agree, agree with this before I would say yes. So now you make the assumption. Assume your boss was here. He heard my presentation, and if I turned to him right now and I said, so Bob, do you think that the Culligan should be installed in the office? If he says yes, you're in, right? Yeah, if my boss is in. So now you're just checking to make sure that it's the real objection. If it's not, he's going to say, whoa, wait, 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 wait. We haven't even talked about price yet. I think your price is pretty high. Now you go back to the boss and you say, so what you're telling me is you're concerned about the price, but on something like this, you could really make the decision. Yeah. So now that objection is gone. Out to the side, and now you can talk about price. <coughs> Next objection, the product. So what objection is a, is a customer going to have? They're going to say, I'm happy. I've been dealing with this, with, with this company, with another company, who's shampooing my rug, or we do it ourselves, and we're happy. So how do you respond? One. Great. What is it about the rug doctor that you really appreciate? Smile. Well, I like this. And you say, and why is that important to you? Because of blah, 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 blah. Oh, great. Now, what are you listening for? You're listening because that's an obstacle over which you must pass to get the order. Can you deliver on that? So you're asking questions to determine whether you can. What else do you like? Well, I like this right here. And what else do you like? And I like this right here. Well, that's great. I can see why you're 100% why you're happy. Now, one additional question. If you could wave your magic wand, and suddenly there's something about the rug doctor that you've always wanted to improve, pause, let him think. What would that be? Well, you know, I have to go down to Lowe's to pick it up. And you say, really? So why is that? Well, I got a pickup truck. When I put it in the back of the pickup truck, if I don't chain it down, then it rumbles in the back. And last time I did it, I broke off the cap. Ooh. So what happened then? <laughs> Implication question. Well, I had to replace it. And my God, they charged me an extra 50 bucks. Can you solve that problem, Mr. Bailey? Absolutely. So you'd say, so if I could show you a way that you'd never have to put the rug doctor in your truck again, you'd get magnificently clean carpeting, would you want to talk about that? No. You say, what personal benefits would flow to you? That's the end of spin. Well, I didn't have to do that. I wouldn't have to worry about that. I wouldn't have to borrow the truck from my neighbor. I wouldn't have to spend my time going down. <coughs> He's telling you the benefits of your system before you even talk to him about it. Mr. Bailey, I want to pivot in on this for your next sale. <laughs> or the person could say, I don't know anything about your company or your product. At that point, you're ready because you've responded to what we talked about last week and you have a testimonial letter right here. And you say, I'm not surprised you haven't heard of us because this firm that you're working with has a national brand. 
Interestingly enough, one of your neighbors, Bob Smith, lives right over here. Bob? Yes. We, we cleaned his carpets last week, and here's the letter that he wrote to me, to my boss, saying how much he appreciated about our treatment. Powerful way to combat the product objection. Next, testimony. Next is the source. Same kind of issue. I love this company. Same issue, we're going to do it again. What do you like about your company? What do you appreciate? <laughs> Write it down. Have them tell you the benefits. Wave your magic wand. Answer it the same way. Now here's the one you got to nail. Money. This is going to comprise 80% of the objections you get, and you've got to know how to handle them. You have to memorize how to do it. First. In the middle, just as you're starting your presentation, you're asking questions, the person says, what do you charge to do this? Now, why do they do this? Don't you want to well, They're interested. If it's not in the price range, they don't want to hear all your spiel. They're thinking, I only have this many of this one. And this is going to cost me money. I don't want it. They're thinking about price. So you have to be able to delay the price. Remember we talked about this? So how do you do it? So what's the price, Mr. Gorman? So what's your price? It's $49.95. No, that's way too much. Before you add the value, the price is always way too much. So you say, you want to get the very best price possible. True? Yes, I do then what I need to do is ask you a few more questions to determine whether or not this is right for you. And after I ask those questions, then I'll supply you with our price for doing that. And you, then you're going to be in charge. You be the judge of whether or not this is right for you. I memorized that, thanks to my old friend Brian Tracy. I memorized it word for word, and I've used it over and over and over and over. It works. Unless you get the high D. It says, all right, listen, young whippersnapper. <laughs> what is your price? I'm not taking that bait. We use car guys use this all the time. What's your price? Then you say? The price is all that matters to you. Hold on a second. You're, you're close, Miss Buckner. So price is your only concern. Well, it's not my only concern. Thank you. So I want to get to those concerns, to the price concern. But first, if you'll just let me ask a couple questions. I promise you, I'll give you the price, and then you can be the judge as to whether or not this price is right for you. It's memorized. I'll go. Okay, unless he says, yes, it's my only concern. At that point, you say, Academy Award. <sighs> I'm so sorry, Mr. Gormley. At our firm, we're not the lowest price because, we, because our customers love what we do. I'm so sorry we're not going to be able to do business today. Thanks very much for spending this time with Walk. Wait, 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 get your butt back here. <laughs> okay, ask me a couple questions. What is that? <coughs> no, no, no. What they, when you're walking away, they say, well, what is it, though? Yeah, instead of wait, what did they say? Just walk up. I, I would love <laughs> for us to do business, but not just, <laughs> it's not just about price. You can get the rug doctor at Walmart is cheaper than we are. Thanks. Thanks very much. Smile. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Except I hate that rug doctor. I just want you to be cheaper than the rug doctor. Mm, can't do it. Next. It's not in our budget. How do you handle this one? If it was in your budget, you'd go ahead. True. Smoke out the objection. 
assume it away. If it was in your budget, then you'd go ahead. Well, I mean, not so fast. No, it's not a budget issue, it's something else. Get that issue on the table. Next, your price is way too high. Smile. You're right, Mr. Smith. Our price is the highest in the marketplace. Yet, yesterday I sold two units. Would you like to know why people bought them? No problem. Now you're going to emphasize value. Next, time issue, stalling. If people say, I want to think about it. You ask, may I ask, what is it that causes you the most concern? Listen, unless you get it on the table, you're not going to make the sale. Now, how do you resolve these objections? First, the book is wrong. On direct denial, never ever disagree with your client. A direct or indirect. Why? Dale Carnegie told you. Don't complain. Don't criticize. Don't condemn. Don't do it. There's no benefit. So agree with their perception. And then say, so help me understand, Mr. Smith, why is this your opinion? Smile. The important thing is not to be right. What's the important thing? Get the order. So take the ego out, D's. Take it out. It doesn't matter. Let them think they're right. Now, what if they're wrong and you have a way? They just don't see what you see, then it's your job. You gotta go back up here and reinvestigate that. It's okay. The direct denial, the indirect denial, both bad. Agree. Always agree. So what if someone says, how much is that? Same issue. If value's here and price is up there, don't give them the price. Ask them. So for that one, that typically is used for this and this and this. Is that what you need it for? Go back to needs. Every one of you, hopefully, will be selling a product that has margins in it. And margins are maintained. When margins are maintained, you can create a profit for you and your client. Do not release the price too early. Now I want you to hear a classic way for how to continue to sell when you've got one of the worst <laughs> objections in front of you. The worst objection you get, Mr. Bailey, is? So your price is too much, you can say. I understand, Mr. Bailey, exactly how you feel. I don't want to spend that much money on carpet. I don't want to spend that much money on carpet. I understand exactly how you feel. Many of my clients felt the same way as you do before we cleaned their first carpet. But after we cleaned it, they found that the cleaning was so thorough that finally they wanted to spend more time in the basement. Feel, felt, found. Got it? You have to practice this over and over and over. All right. Feel, felt, found. Next. <clears throat> Giving them a trial offer is a fabulous thing to do if you identified the need, they've expressed the need, they can see the benefits to them, let them try it. Now, let's talk about techniques. A couple techniques that you should know 
to be able to combat objections. One, they're going to say, oh. <laughs> I want to see a proposal. Now, or they'll say, I, I have your proposal, and we won't spend more than $8,500. So the technique is to unbundle. Unbundle. Unbundling means that they've said, all I'll pay is $8,500. So you take out some things that they really want. You can do this, can't you, Mr. Bailey? Unbundle something on the price, they'll go, ooh, I really want that. Mm -hmm. Next. A technique is if you're, if you're there and they're here, and they're both within the range, you have to be careful. Will you split the difference? If you can split the difference, and still, you're generate, it's, in, it's within your range. Just know that you can never raise your price above that going forward. Be very careful and split the difference. How about, this is my offer, take it or leave it. So they're in control. This is a situation in which you might walk. And if you walk, just after you've gone through the need and what you're going to do, and yet if it's take it or leave it, the answer is, I'd love to do it. What I'd, I'd like to do is put this back on the agenda in another month. You go to your people, I'll go to mine, and let's see if we can come back together. So, so the take it or leave it, but uh, not the take it or leave it, but the split one. You say if you give them a price, but what if your company raises prices in a year or two? Did you, not, did you raise it then? What if your company raises prices? Can you raise your price? You have no other option. Now, if you do not, if you're not delivering value to them, then you risk getting fired. So at every point, once you get the order, you call them and say, and they've used the product, you call and say, how's it going? Oh, it's doing this and this and we love it. And you say, are you using it for this? No, we didn't know that. Are you using it for this? No. You add value, add value, add value. So later, if the price is raised, you're already contributing more value. Now, what if they say, lower your price now and we'll give you all the business in the future. Be careful, be careful. Instead, you can say, I can't discount the price now, but I will discount in the future. Today, we started by saying, I'm here to help all of you put more Benjamins in your pocket by helping you answer important questions. The bridge between your presentation and your close. So view objections as questions. They're just questions you need to answer. Dig in, memorize some of these responses to classic questions, use them in your Culligan presentation. When you do, you're gonna feel like you're in control. You're gonna feel like you can surmount any challenge, and you'll have more benefits. You have more Benjamins in your pocket. Any final questions? All right, guys. So team three will be presenting.